I invite you to uh, give a warm welcome to Dr. Mary Ann Wolf. I'm going to lead you through several knowledge bases. And what's so interesting to me is that there's always something new that you were learning about reading and literacy and the reading brain. And what we do in this field is to connect. We're connecting information from neuroscience about what happens even at a cellular level, but very importantly, at a circuit level. How does the brain build in networks to make us able to learn something that's totally new? And so we're building knowledge bases just like the brain uses different parts of itself. The science of reading uses information from psychology, developmental psychology, um, education, technology, and in my case, a heavy dose of neuroscience. And the questions that we are asking, I'm gonna be with you about five different questions. How in the world did we ever learn to read in the first place? Why do some children fail or have such struggles? What is dyslexia? Very importantly, I will pre be presenting research that we never even dreamed of when I was with you last, and that's whether we can predict it in kindergarten in ways that we <laughs> never could have dreamed of doing. And then I'm going to be talking only just very briefly about intervention. The people who've been working with you in workshops uh, I'm just sure they did a fantastic job, and I'll just be t giving you a whiff of that. But I will end today in a cautionary tale. Every one of us here, every single person is changing. Because when we read on screens, we are reading in particular ways that bleed over into our work with on books, on, on print. Okay, so one of the things that I want to really talk about with all, all of us is that we have to think about what is happening to our children who are learning to read more on screens and what are the implications of the fact that our brain reflects the medium it's reading upon. We will, we, there are heavy duty worries. I've always been a reading warrior <laughs> and now I'm a reading worrier and we will get to that. So, but all this begins with something that those of you who've heard me before know. This is the light motif. This is the basic. The human brain was never born to read. It was born to smell and run and think and see and taste and speak even. We have whole genetic programs, but we were never born to read ever. We don't have a gene for it. We don't have a single structure. But what it teaches us is that when we learn how the brain forms a circuit, we learn a great deal about how the brain learns anything new. So there's basic science here, but then there's applied science. Because once you realize that we're building this circuitry out of older parts that were based on vision, on language, on cognition, and affect. And over time, we're learning to get them more and more together. The fact is, however, that we have some very tricky and amazing principles that allow us to do that. Now, the first is that we have this ability to form a new circuit. We can learn new things because our brain has these, these, these principles that allow it to go beyond itself by rearranging itself. We also have this other amazing principle, which is recycling. We can recycle neurons that were made for identifying faces and objects, and we can make them able to be responsible for new things like letters or in different languages, characters. So we have this principle of neuronal recycling that allows us to repurpose our areas and learn new things. Now, this is extremely important for teachers of reading, and you are tutors of reading. A lot of people in the 20th century 
believe that if you just give children an environment of, of great literature, they're going to automatically learn that. The brain doesn't work like that very easily. It needs to represent the letters and letter patterns of our language and make neurons responsible for them. So one of the things they're tough about is that they had believed this old idea that drill is kill, kill and drill. This is wrong. What the brain is doing is making representations of letters in the visual cortex. That is not drill. That is the repetitions, the exposures needed to get it down. And some of you are tutoring kids who seem to get it on Tuesday, and you're back on Thursday, and it, whoosh, it's gone. This is not because only of memory. This is because some of our children, especially if they have a beautiful brain like the brain in dyslexia, they need more exposures. So you need to work harder. It's not you, it's not them, it's a difference in brain organization. But we need to get these representations down in the visual cortex, which means a lot of repetition for some of our kids, not all of them but 10 to 20 percent certainly need that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like just to talk about, and um, we were actually talking, Caroline and I were talking about, she was a, an engineer, and for her, the whole concept of a circuit really makes sense. I would like all of it, all of us, to realize that's a way of thinking about the reading brain that will help you realize there are multiple things that you are connecting when you are tutoring. And your connections are gonna be different in English than they would be in Chinese or Japanese. The Chinese brain or the Japanese kanji brain has to have a lot of right visual, uh, visual cortex. Why do you think that? How many does a fifth grader in China need? 5,000. And you wusses complaining. <laughs> right, 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 I know you. <laughs> but the reality is whatever language we're learning, we are building a new circuit. We are, we, this is who, who we are. We build every, every reader, but that means also that every reader will have different experiences to connect. And this is where, and Jose and I were talking about this, people don't realize that in the United States of America, we have many children from zero to five who do not have the same playing field as others. And we need to realize that this zero to five period is really important for those things that need to get connected to the circuitry. Exposure to English language. How, how many of the kids are you tutoring who are bilingual or trilingual? Multilingual kids have beautiful brains. And at the end of the day, this is, this is the, one of the best brains you could ever have. But in the beginning, it's tough. And you have to learn which language you're going to read in to get those phonemes, those smallest units of sound. So in those first five years, I am absolutely a warrior. We have to be sure our kids are getting as much exposure to whatever language they have, whatever that first language is and the concepts that go with it. But the reality is that we need to understand how important the programs are for zero to five and five to 10 to give our kids the level playing field they need. And in that level playing field, there are aspects of language that you as tutors and teachers and organizers and, and heads of libraries everywhere, you need to realize our kids from zero to 10 are always building these systems in language, learning the phonemes of what language they're going to read. That's very important. Learning letter patterns, learning words. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of vocabulary. And vocabulary doesn't exist without sentences and grammar and stories. Well, 
Every child that we can give in that zero to five, five to 10 period, books that make them love words. I have lived my life in the service of words. And that's what all of us do. But the thing is, we have to make our kids feel the same way. Because semantic development in those books is not just about vocabulary. It's about concepts. It's about richness of networks. You see, words exist in your brain. And they exist in neighborhoods. It's like Mr. Rogers has these neighborhoods of words in our brains. It's not just semantic development. We're learning moral development, ethical development, social development. We're learning that frog and toe, what to do when frog is sick, what to do when George loses his front tooth. And we're learning spatial things about Curious George. Remember when he's in a balloon way up in the sky and everything looks like a toy house? Well, guess what? That's depth perception. There are so many things that go on in the reading of books. And we who, who are part of the world of books, we are giving so much language to children who might not have it. Now, this is an older study that was done around here in which people were simply taping how many words, uh, occasions of words that children heard when they were between three and four. Well, what they realized is something that we just never knew, how dramatically different our kids are. Because our children who come from these privileged homes, they're hearing words all the time over and over and over. These kids who are on welfare, it's not that money equals words. It's money is, gives opportunity to hear more words. And these parents often are giving words that are more safety oriented. Oh, don't do that. Be careful. You know, not the elaboration, the, oh, isn't this wonderful what you've done? Oh, that color is what? Red? Oh, what is scarlet? It's red and scarlet. You are constantly elaborating with children, and yet a lot of our parents have no time to do that. And so the result is this child comes to kindergarten having heard 30 million less words. Now, I'm here as a neuroscientist. I'm telling you that's real in the brain. The networks for those words that they hear over and over and over again, they are well used. They are they're connected, and they make just like you do. When you hear a joke, you know why you understand a joke and I don't tell jokes? I don't, I, the worst, uh, you, neuroscientists are pitiful in their humor, <laughs> and so I don't even try. But what happens when other people tell jokes, usually is that you are activating an alternative meaning. Now how's that for unfunny? But, <laughs> but that's what you do. When you activate a word, it activates all kinds of things. The reality is, when you know it, you are elaborating neuronal networks. And when you don't know it, you aren't. So that 30 million word is not just about repetitions of words. It's about networks that when they read, they will activate. And that's the story of human development. Use it or lose it. And you have children here who have no concepts to hook onto, no beautiful words. And so what we end up doing is having what, I, what was once called, the this, this Stanovich called it the Matthew effect, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's what happens in language. And so when we're talking about books, we're talking about language development, we're talking about an entire conceptual background for our children. I'm working with pediatricians uh, in an organization called Reach Out and Read, and I'm working with people who are doing uh, imaging of those children at three and four who've been read to versus those who haven't. And quite literally, the brain is changing in areas that are responsible for comprehension and, this surprised us, for expression. So literally, the kids who were just being read to 
were having their language areas more and more developed than the kids who weren't read to. And so if a radio station gives me one minute, only one minute, I will say, talk to your kids and read to them every single day. Because so much happens when we do just that. And one of the things that we've also figured out in our lab is that the kids who will go on, they're genetically have a propensity towards dyslexia from their family heritage, and they do better ultimately when they are being read to despite um, what is going to be dyslexia. And if we look at this kind of brain, if you will, all this stuff that happens is happening under, you know, it's just milliseconds. I call it the Proustian pause. After you get all this information, the sounds, the meanings, the multiple meanings, you get a moment in time that's really so tiny to either add your own thoughts, your own analysis, what I call the deep reading processes, or not. And this is the story of, going to be the story of technology. Because when you are in a medium that's advantaging speed of processing, go, 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 you're doing a Z or you're doing an F, you are not necessarily giving time inside your brain to really thinking about it. So this is, and with our kids, I'm especially interested in them learning with physical print first and then helping them learn how to do digital reading in a very careful way. So what we call, what I call the Proustian pause is really about the heart of deep reading. And deep reading is giving us a time very, very quick and you're, it's imperceptible to you, but it's still a decision that you are making to slow yourself down think and feel about what you're reading. So here are the processes that we are talking about. Per background knowledge. Reading is cumulative. Everything you give those kids, everything you read, they read. You are building a block. We have to make sure they are really with you attending. Attending is, is an amazing, important thing about it. But each new reading builds upon what went before. When we are in that beginning part of reading, we are adding at, over time what we feel. Reading is like a moral laboratory for us. It gives us a chance to try on what another person feels like. From a neuroscience viewpoint, it's giving us a theory of the other's mind, and it's practice. And one of the, my favorite books in the world is Gilead by the novelist Marilyn Robinson. If you have time to read a wonderful book this summer, there's no sex, there's no mystery, there's no murder, and people get mad at me because they expect it to be suspenseful and exciting. No, but it is beautiful. And it is a book by this wonderful author, Marilyn Robinson. And Obama went to her. Obama told her that the novel is how I learned that life is gray. It's not about black versus white. It's about the grays of human development. And the novel gave me empathy. And he tells the world that Marilyn Robinson is an ambassador of empathy. And this is what she said. The trend towards seeing those different as sinister other is the greatest danger to continuing our democracy. We are teaching empathy to the young. And one of the things that Jane Smiley, the novelist, said, she's not worried that the novel's going to die but she is worried that it's going to be sidelined. And if it is sidelined, she said this three years ago, we will be led by people, we will be led by people who will never have understood truly who others are, what others feel, and our democracy will be brutalized. That's what Jane Smiley said. Jane Smiley. So I look at what we're doing as a democratic service because we are thinking how can we be sure that kids grow up to understand how others feel how can we 
how can we help reading occur in such a way there's critical analysis and they're not sitting around all day with their digital games and tablets and not listening or learning what they could. This is a real tricky time we're in. And imagery is one of the ways that we get into empathy. Some of you have read this before. It's a very tough six-word short story that Hemingway wrote on a bet. It's really hard. You already grabbed full, you, 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 you couldn't help but use this image to go deeper into yourself. This is what reading does. He won the bet that he could write a short story, but what he told others is it was one of the most powerful pieces of writing he'd ever done in six terse words. But it also gives me an example to give you importance of empathy. It's not just about feeling, it's about knowing. And if you look at it from a neuroscience viewpoint, it's about theory of mind as well as compassion. But it's also a gateway into inference, analogy. What you know, what you learn, the concepts you already possess, that's the basis for making an analogy to the text. This is tough stuff. You are analogy makers. Human beings are always making analogies between what they know and what they are reading or what they're seeing. That's what new consolidated information is born. It gives us a chance for inference. Well, that's the basis of critical analysis. I suggest to you, however, that even though Sherlock Holmes is fabulous in deduction, that Miss Marple <laughs> is my favorite metaphor for the deep reading brain because she is very inferential. She's very much partaking the perspective, but she's empathetic and she uses that to build up what we read and know from what we read. But that is the gateway to something that doesn't happen all the time. In fact, all too rarely do we have time for insights. My whole hope is that for you, when you read, you will have time to take for your own insight processes. There's this dimension which I call the contemplative dimension to reading. And it's this moment where you go beyond the author to your own best thoughts and feelings. I mean, if there was nothing more that I give you in this talk, it's this tiny insight for yourself. Reading is about the generativity, the generative nature inside us that goes beyond the thoughts of that author into our own best. That's what I want for you, and that's what I want you to pass on to our children, whoever you tutor. Now, <laughs> this is Thomas Aquinas. Why in the world am I using Thomas Aquinas? Well, he said, when he was asked what he's most grateful for, he said, I am most grateful that I understood everything I ever read. Oh, oh well, oh well. Uh, <laughs> I will only say I have never come close to feeling like Thomas Aquinas for many reasons. But I use him to show how amazing the breeding brain is. Those, that's just the minimum of the processes you use with the deep breeding brain. It takes, it takes years to be able to make such a brain circuit. And when you are tutoring, no matter what age group you're tutoring, you are building an ever deeper reading brain. That's what you're doing. And for us, well, we have to remember that it's the purpose of reading to reach those, those critical analysis and empathy processes. Now, I'm only gonna spend about four minutes on this, but I just want you to realize some of you are tutoring children and individuals with dyslexia. This is one fantastic brain. And I usually give an hour lecture on dyslexia to many groups so they understand that our world would never have been the same without these 
amazing individuals. And as you see, I, there's a, the history is full of men. <laughs> not too many women on this, and that's not true for dyslexia. It's probably two or three to one, uh, male to female. So there are more boys than, than girls, but there are women, and we have overlooked them often because they're good girls and don't show up as you know problems. You, however, do not know this one name here of an artist, Ben Wolf Noam. Well, my dears, there he is, LA's finest struggling artist, my son. <laughs> I don't know where he gets it. <laughs> but the reality is so many of us have children or no individuals who are dyslexic because it's five to 10% of the human race, They're everywhere. Everywhere, it's a, different, it's a different organization of the brain. And it's a beautiful one, but it is different. And for those of us who are studying it, this is my, one of my groups at uh, University of California, San Francisco. We're doing all kinds of things to look at both the strengths and the weaknesses. Because we've been emphasizing all those weaknesses, but there's the reason why we have a dyslexic brain is because the species needs it. It was there before we learned to read. Reading is only 6,000 years old. That brain's been here 50,000 years because we need builders and artists and people who think differently. And as a researcher and a mother, I can swear they think differently. <laughs> it's never been and never will be about them being different. It's been about our inability to know what to teach and how to teach. And then, we started thinking, oh, well, now we're diagnosing them, but we're always diagnosing too late. And when you do that, you are not giving them the intervention early enough to prevent all the social emotional detritus that happens. You know, they feel, why am I the only one who can't read? Am I stupid? Everyone says, oh, no, you're not dumb. You're so smart. Well, they feel stupid. And here my son had a, you know, a reading scholar in the house and it didn't matter. They feel inadequate and they act out. And those are some of the stories I would love to tell you only over tea <laughs> or something stronger. But it is, <laughs> it is the case that there is such a feeling of something being wrong with them. And we have to change the entire conceptualization of dyslexia to understand this is one heck of a great brain. We can tell you who's gonna be what in kindergarten, who's gonna be a superior reader, who's gonna be you know, just plain fine with good teaching, who's gonna be a surprise. The only one I'm gonna tell you about right here is this surprise one. This green line, you'll never catch them. They are as good as the superior and they look totally average. And the only thing that they are different in is this one task called a naming speed task. It's called RAN or RAS. And my mentor, Martha Dinklow, and I um, have, have done a lot of research on this. Uh, she created it, I redesigned it, but the reality is what this does is make the brain connect vision and language fast. And the kids who can't do that are the ones who will go on to become this green line and in kindergarten, it's the only thing that will identify them. They look perfect until third grade and then they're like, they're failing in fluency and comprehension. And you get a lot of the kids who have fluency issues. Some of them are undiagnosed dyslexic kids. So we, and the, the other ones, we, we know a great deal about before, but we can tell you who they are now. That's what's different. And we can introduce, and that stays stable over time. These kids, you know, these are wonderful kids who get good instruction, but those kinds of profiles really need help right away. The reality is that there's 37, minimum, 37% of our kids in fourth grade who are not reading well at all. They're not reading fluently, and it's even worse than that. And this is where I get a stab in my stomach because we have got to change this. Among that group, 61% of our African-American kids, especially the boys, 
are struggling to reach basic re uh, reading levels, 54% of our Latino kids. This is unconscionable. And inside that whole group, and there's a man that I'm working with, Sean Robinson, on reading and writing quarterly, is this group of forgotten boys. Some of them are gifted, some of them are dyslexic, but a lot of them are for a lot of different reasons not making it. When you don't make fluent reading in fourth grade, it's a ticket to failure the rest of your life. And you're the group who can supplement, who can complement, who can make sure that those kids who don't make it in fourth grade, between fourth and eighth grade, that you are giving them reason and, and strategies to get ever better. We have been working on intervention. Now, this one is called RAVO. This is where we look at how we can make children aware of the world of words and help those who are struggling in first, second, even third grade do better. And so we have these strategies, but one of the strategies is one I want to give you. That's why I'm going to actually tell you a tiny bit. And that is we teach already how the words in English are often multiple meaning, just like tracks. And a lot of kids are not aware of that simple concept. And helping them from the start know that our words can have multiple meanings helps them read and not get um, confused when the fish is on the bank and it doesn't make any sense unless they know what a river bank is. And so we're writing these stories and some of you know I'm an English major, two degrees, and yet look at this horrible story. Duck, duck, the duck, duck. <laughs> That's a minute story <laughs> for some kids. But the reality is we, we we're trying to help our kids increase their knowledge of words. And that's a piece of your work. You need to be thinking about how words work and how our kids can change their knowledge of how words work. The other thing that the Italians are doing with our, with our work and we hadn't been doing is looking at the social emotional changes after the intervention. I don't know if you do any of that here to actually look at the results of your tutoring, but we found, not we did, they did, that the kids' self-esteem, their sense of mastery, everything changes when you learn to read well. You, you, become, a, you become at least the beginning of the person you should become. I want to talk about where we are today in this digital world. Now, I told you that the reading brain reflects the writing system. You saw those circuits. And I told you, but you didn't probably process it sufficiently, because I didn't emphasize it, that there are deep, deep implications to having a plastic reading brain with different mediums. And this is this uh, Patricia Greenfield. She had a beautiful statement I want you to think about. Every medium has its costs and weaknesses. Every medium develops some cognitive skills at the expense of others. The internet may develop impressive visual intelligence. The cost seems to be deep processing, mindful knowledge acquisition, inductive analysis, critical thinking, imagination, and reflection. It's deep reading. This is the cost that we have to figure out we don't want to spend in digital reading. We have two huge issues the acquisition of reading on digital screens, and what happens to us. Everybody here has changed too. You may or may not know it. In fact, I do hope you look at my, my new book at some point because you'll see my experiment with myself was so disheartening and discomforting. I saw what, I, what had happened to me, and it was not a pretty story. But the question, the questions are deep themselves. What is happening to the length of things you're looking at? What is happening to the density? Are you searching on Google for only the first half of the first page, which is adjudicated by nothing and is really based on an algorithm that certainly changes a lot, but a lot of the algorithm is based on how many other people used it, which is a common enough denominator 
but it just means popularity rather than knowledge or truth caused it, or worse, money caused it to be in the top group, and that's what you use. You don't use page 20. You don't. You don't look in between. This is who we are. So the density, the length, the complexity, our concentration, and let's face it, when you see something new, if you're on the internet to the right, you go to it or to the left. And the reason is we have a, a reflex, a bias, a novelty bias. Our attention goes like this. And that kept us alive. We needed that when we were you know, surviving with predators. But the reality is our kids are being, our kids are being hyper stimulated by attentional changes, leading them to be only partially attending most of the time. Partial continuous attention is a, a word that has been used a lot with our kids. They need constant stimulation and when they don't get it, what do they say? I ask you truly, how many of you ever used that word when you were young? You just didn't use it very much at all. And our kids who are so stimulated have a new form of boredom that is not the creative form. When we were bored, we were bored, of course. And you go out and you make a tin on the tree. You know, you did all kinds of things with your body, with your motor system that's being underactivated as well. Most importantly, we were not addicted to things in the way that our kids are today. And that's what I really need us to realize. Attention means that you are going to be able to consolidate a fact in memory. If you don't attend fully, you are not able to put it into your memory store, which means next time you read something, it isn't there to make an analogy to. So we're not talking about just this simple phenomenon of flitting attention. We're talking about the relationship between attention, memory, future use of that background knowledge for making analogy and inference and critical analysis. Our kids are changing. And part of it is simply because that mind is being bathed in hormones. These are fight or flight hormones when you're going like this with your attention. So we already know our kids are changing. But I want us as a society to say, let's pause and figure it out instead of just lurching. We are a wonderful society, but we have real flaws when we don't look at evidence or demand evidence for things that will change the brains of our children. We're already, the horse is out of the barn. And so everything I do is really too late at one level, but with everybody's consciousness being raised about this, and there is a lot more consciousness now than there was, we see a 40% decline in empathy in the young. In what I had assumed the opposite because I thought all the interconnectedness would be such a great thing, there's a lot of things going wrong. And part of it is because we sit in the back seat, our children sit in the back seat texting the child next to them on the seat. That's a kind of a metaphor for not having the kind of human interactions that we need. We can't go back, nor should we. We have so many wonderful things, including this ability to predict. You know, we, we can target, we can, we, we're, we're gonna be so much better in, in, in the future, but we must be responsible with knowledge. And we must never just settle for the quick fix or the quick read. We have to think, what is that reading like on email, except from Valerie? <laughs> that can skim fast. But what, is, what requires our true best thought, our true best feeling? So we have to understand, what are we losing? What will we gain? What must we preserve? And for me, ensuring Ensuring the formation and sustaining of deep reading is our society's best inoculation against their vulnerability and ours. We're taking tablets to kids who have no schools. 
no teachers, no books, and we're trying to help them learn to read. So uh, this is not a binary, oh, don't do this, don't do that. No, it's the use of wisdom. And I, I'm going to end with my, I wish I could say my dear friend, but <laughs> <laughs> children are a sign. They are a sign of hope, a sign of life, but also a diagnostic sign, a marker indicating the health of family, society, and the entire world. Wherever children are accepted, loved, cared for, and protected, the family is healthy, society is more healthy, and the world is more human. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the ways you make this world more human. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>